you for joining us on another episode of Popcorn for Breakfast, a movie review edition of Popcorn for Breakfast, with my co-reviewer and co-host, Kirk. Hello, hello. You're looking very menacing today, Kirk. Trying to be ominous, like you don't know whether I live on the good side or the dark side or somewhere in the gray. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that was. I knew kind of what you were getting at there, but it was good for dramatic effect. Uh, I am your other co host, Cam. And as Kirk has not so subtly alluded to, um, today we are reviewing a film that has released on Netflix, also had a limited run in theaters. Um, yes. As is sometimes the case with Netflix films these days. A film called The Gray Man, starring Ryan Gosling. Chris Evans, uh, Ana de Armas, Jessica Henwick. Uh, who, who am I missing? Reggae Jean um, Page. Alfrey. Alfrey Woodard. Alfrey Woodard. Big cast, uh, big names, biggest budget in Netflix history to date for a feature boom. film directed by the Russo brothers as well, who directed Captain America Winter Soldier, uh, Avengers Endgame, Avengers Infinity War, 21 Bridges, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Cherry, right? Yes. Yeah, so big big names, big movie, based on a, a best-selling spy thriller novel of the same title, The Gray Man. Kirk, you are up on synopsis. Why don't you take it away, my friend? Just a, just a quick clarifying question. This is episode, what, 302? At this point, is that correct? 202. 202. <laughs> I'm from the future. I, <laughs> I was going to say, you. do we make it that far? Wow. <laughs> this is episode 202. We are doing spoiler-free reviews. Is that correct? Oh, are we? I don't know. I mean, we, never officially, of... we never officially stated that. I think we oh. should do spoiler-full because you it's on Netflix. You want to spoil this bad boy? I just feel like I it's agree. on Netflix, and we're unorganized. So let's just lean into it. You have now witnessed behind the curtain. <laughs> We're making with live popcorn decisions for breakfast. <laughs> All right, I'm going to spoil the mess out of this. Because when I saw this poster, I said, "Well, which one is the gray man per se?" Right. And in the first 45 seconds of this movie, you find out it's Ryan Gosling. Spoiler alert: You've been spoiled. Let's talk about this movie. This movie is about an international. Uh, crime, uh, spy, espionage story. It's an international thriller that follows our hero named, codename, Sierra Six, a.k.a. Ryan Gosling, a.k.a. future Ken Doll in Greta Gerwig's Barbie. He's an elite agent brought in through an undercover special ops rehabilitation, rehabilitation program. That's a pretty cool phrase. Undercover Special Ops Rehabilitation Program. I think that would be a really sick rap if you said it over and over again. He lives by a different set of rules. He doesn't have any red tape. There's no trace of him. He has been trained to live in the gray. Okay? His assignments are so secret that if anyone were to try to find out his identity, um, everyone would disavow him. Uh, similar to, uh, the, uh, you know, if you think of uh, The Departed, if you think of Leo DiCaprio's role, only two people knew who he was, and they would deny uh, that, they, that they ever knew him unless his his mission was successful. Uh, many espionage thrillers go this way, kind of like the Bourne Ultimatum, right? We have this this uh, this secret program that trains these people, that gives them all these special skills and resources, and it's a, a thrilling multi-country sprawl in present day in 2021 to be exact of Ryan Gosling being put on a mission. The mission goes awry and he's trying to put the pieces back together. We have an accelerating cast. Uh, all of the people that Cam just mentioned that intertwine with who's bad, who's good, who's also living in the gray and who ultimately will come out on top. The Gray Man, streaming now. Yeah, and a lot of people don't know this, but it's actually a sequel to that movie, The Gray, that starred uh, uh, Liam Neeson, where he's li- he there's he survives a plane crash and he gets attacked uh. by wolves. Ryan Gosling was the wolf in the original movie, oh. so 
And the sequel to The Gray Man is The Wolf Man that Ryan Gosling <laughs> is starring in in the next couple of That's years. Right. This is this perfect. This is The Gray Wolf Man uh, cinematic universe. Yes. <laughs> so there you go. All right. Um, let's get into this, Kirk. Obviously a huge cast. We're going to start by talking about our acting superlatives. Um, great synopsis. Obviously it takes a lot of inspiration from a lot of different, you know, things, you know, I know that it's its own book, but it takes inspiration cinematically. I think from mission impossible, certainly James Bond, um, from a plot line perspective, suicide squad, you know, the suicide squad, very similar to that. I mean, it's, it's not an uncommon thing. You use a, use an ex con to help, help you, you know, I'll give you amnesty. You give me whatever I want, et cetera, et cetera. But Let's get into it, Kirk. Let's let's get into the nitty gritty. We're going to start with our first acting superlative, which is called "And the Oscar Goes to," which goes to the best actor in the film. Kirk, who are you giving it to? You know what? Before I announce this, I really believe that we need props for this. I'm a big props guy. I do not have the prop, full disclosure, with me tonight, but I am going to go to Target and buy that like best dad ever trophy that's always there. Yeah, <laughs> I'm gonna. I'm going to scrape it off and in white Sharpie, I'm going to write and the Oscar goes to, uh, so that's just my promise to the viewers for the video feed. So be on the lookout for that in six weeks when I finally remember that I said that on this episode, <laughs> uh, Masker, it goes to Mr. Ryan Gosling. You know, you first saw him in either the Mickey Mouse Clubhouse reboot or Goosebumps. Um, He might have been also in an episode of Are You Afraid of the Dark? He has done it all. Oscar nominated, Emmy nominated. There's no rhyme or reason why Ryan Gosling's career is so successful when you just look at him and you look at the roles he's taken on. But when you actually watch what he's done and how careful he is with these characters uh then you really start to understand him as an actor that while he's not someone who is going to transform uh like a leonardo dicaprio or more importantly like a christian bale um ryan gosling is coming to give special care to each of the characters that he gets cast in um some big call outs for this one are uh finding a relationship with a little girl uh, who is the niece of his mentor played by billy bob thornton his niece is played by julia butters who if you are obsessed with once upon a time in hollywood like me she is the actress on the actual film set uh the uh, of the film uh, that that leo gets his groove back if you will uh so julia butters is there she's the niece uh which is a nice curveball because uh in this moment we have billy bob thornton is trying to be Uh, trying to press buttons against by Chris Evans. I hope you're following Chris Evans presses Billy Bob Thornton's niece to get to Ryan Gosling, to get to his location. Once they've exposed that he is, uh, he has some special Intel and uh, the normal plot line, the most normal plot line that should have happened would have been Billy Bob Thornton's granddaughter or daughter. And I was appalled at first that they're like, Oh, it's my niece. And I was very worried from the film immediately. (laughs) You know, this is like 10 minutes in. And then they showed this long flashback sequence of Ryan Gosling protecting and getting to know her. The 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 care he took into that of developing a one-on-one relationship to her was so exquisite and so unique. And I feel like he does that with every single person that he comes across. Uh, you see it with how he treats Billy Bob Thornton the way they communicate with each other, the way he speaks to Ana de Armas uh, in this as well. It, it's just really about when you're an actor, if you can build a relationship with the people around you, unique and different relationships as they exist in your world, then you really have a key that no one else has. Think about it. You have a mother, you have a father, you have a friend, you have an enemy, you have a child, you have a niece, a nephew, whatever, what have you. You treat them all differently. You treat, you don't have the same relationship with them. You're not connected to them in the same way. And I think Ryan Gosling is an expert in on-screen relationships. Uh, Off screen, I don't know, but on screen, definitely. So bravo, Mr. Ryan Gosling. You get the Oscar for me tonight. Yeah, Ryan Gosling, he he is certainly one of the most versatile actors that's out there right now and he in terms of what he's able to do at a high level. You know, he's I've always talked about 
probably the most underrated comedic actor currently going yeah. right now. He's absolutely hilarious. He doesn't get to flex that in this movie, but you know, he's a bona fide action star. He can play dramatic roles. He can play comedic roles. He can be in a musical and sing songs and dance. You know, like he really has a lot of different skills and I'm always happy to see him on screen for that reason. Um, I am not giving him my Oscar goes to, I'm actually going to give it to his counterpart, uh, Chris Evans, who played Lloyd Hansen. Um, I find this role interesting for Chris Evans because it's, it's different um, in terms of the, he, he usually gets cast as sort of the all American type of hero or like the cocky hero. Um, he's very rarely an antagonist. I mean, he was an antagonist in knives out, which also starred on a Um, but which I think that's actually a spoiler. <laughs> Sorry if you haven't uh-huh. seen Knives Out. Now you know. Now you know. Um, but anyway, he doesn't get to play this very often. He sought this out. They wanted him for the lead role, and he wanted to be the antagonist. And I think that he was the one character in this movie that just wasn't totally vanilla. Like, sure, at times the character design and the character build out is a little bit caricaturish and a little bit over the top, but his mannerisms and the way that he delivered lines and the improv lines that he threw in and things like that were perfect psychotic villain type of things. And also consistent throughout, which is something that I don't feel like you can say for every actor in this film. I don't feel like every performance was consistent throughout the entire thing. And I just loved the amount of life that, uh, Chris Evans injected into this movie through his character, Lloyd Hansen. He really added a personal touch to it um, and made it something his own. He, you know, got to do the combat stuff, but he also got to do the guy in the chair stuff. Um, I just felt like he really brought something that this movie really needed. And um, a good villain can surprisingly elevate a movie to new heights. And even though I wish they had gone deeper into kind of like who was you know, like who's pulling the strings above him because he was really just kind of like a mercenary operative. And so that was a weird thing to have as the main villain. His performance as that character was, I think, as good as it could have been with the way that it was written and the way that he interpreted it. So I really liked Chris Evans in this role. Um, I thought he was great opposite Ryan Gosling. And they made a, they made a good duo, particularly in the latter half of the film when things really started to ramp up from a plot perspective so true he seeing that mustache and seeing these two just go at it the whole time their chemistry in particular was just fierce the way i mean they're they have had so many movies where they've had to have hand-to-hand combat so they're already versed in (laughs) studying like combat on screen and when they finally get to fight in this uh multiple times but really that finale when they're just going at it is masterful absolutely masterful yeah, it's good stuff for sure. The, it really, when you get to their final moments together, it really does feel significant, which is what you want. You want the stakes to feel high. You want to feel like you have skin in the game, and you want to feel like no matter how this ends, no matter which one of these guys goes down, or if both of them go down, or if neither of them go down, it's going to be impactful. Like that's how you want to feel, and I feel like that is mostly how you feel in that in their final few clashes so all right let's move into the supporting cast which is obviously this is a deep roster tons of huge stars big names uh, people who've been there done it on on big stages kirk who did you go for for your scene stealer let me start by saying i really always just want to vote ana de armas because she is an incredible actress like she really really is i just don't think that the role that she played was written uh, to its fullest. Honestly, if I had to say that what character out of all of this, uh, there was much more there that didn't get completed. Um, it's hers, unfortunately. Uh, so I really wanted to vote for her. I was on the fence, but I'm going to go with tonight and for all eternity immortalized forever for my children and my grandchildren, and my great grandchildren to listen to on repeat, Jessica Henwick. She plays Suzanne Brewer. She is part of the the group that is tasked with disbanding uh, Sierra Six in a way. She, uh, you know her from Iron Fist, the only good part of Iron Fist series, uh, Matrix Four Resurrections, and she is actually, ironically, coming out in Knives Two 
or the glass onion, a knives out mystery. So it comes full circle. Everyone's going to come back to knives out because there's so many uh, roles to fill in that, in that Ryan Johnson film. I think that Jessica Henwick does an incredible job in creating this, this character of ambitious and uh, following the rules and uh, also finding a way to live in the gray and by the end of this film but before the twist. And I love her all the way up until the twist. I think she's fierce. I love her banter specifically with Chris Evans. I think she holds her own and their maniacal hatred towards one another is so impressive. I absolutely love it when two characters hate each other like deeply and you just feel how how vocal they are about it it's such an incredible thing because i think it's because in real life there's people that you just do not get along with um you you just kind of like oh this is not the right time for me to be interacting with larry who's here right (laughs) whoever it might be and be to be able to vocalize that to the nth degree i think that's why that those character types are so fun uh specifically for me for people that hate each other uh through and through there's not a redeeming quality about them and what jessica does is she puts all of her effort and energy into it all of her vulnerability into it and it's impressive. It really, really is. I'm really, I'm really proud to because I'm her father. Uh, I don't want to announce that here tonight <laughs> wow. on Popcorn for Breakfast. She's uh, three years younger than me, and I think she's I'm her father. She, she really is uh, just an absolute star in the making. Um, she's already earned her her legs through all the incredible feats that she's done. She's cast in a dozen more productions coming up over the next five years. So bravo to Jessica Henwick and uh, man, did they really blow her character at the end? I, I mean, yeah, I'm assuming they want to do the gray man too. Uh, possibly. Sure. Seems whole. that way. Kirk sure Pardon? seems that way. I mean, I know se- sequels, nobody wants to do a sequel. There's no money in that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but they, they sure seem to be leaning that way. Don't they? They sure do. They sure do. Well, Kirk, happy to say you're right on the money because my scene stealer is also Jessica Henwick. And I think it's, it's remarkable because like, is there anybody who has done more with less (laughs) like the way that she did in this movie? Because she really, her role in the first, I'll be generous and say two thirds. It's probably closer to three fourths of this movie is really reduced to like, only saying lines that help move the plot forward and like, like for good fun cuts slash explaining things to the audience. Like, wait, do you mean that so-and-so is behind all of this? Where's Sierra six? When we started that program all these years ago, like it's, it's stuff like that to kind of like explain the audience, which is pretty reductive for somebody of her talent, but she freaking nails it. Like those lines and, and frankly, the dialogue in this movie is rough, uh, in my opinion. I think just straight up, like the majority of the time is rough. And she's taking it and working overtime with what I think is really subpar dialogue and turning it into meaningful moments and building a really impactful character who does get the benefit of a giant twist, though I don't love the direction that they're going with her, kind of what you alluded to, Kirk. But I just, she it's hard to even come up with tangible things to say about Jessica Henwick because I felt similarly with her in matrix. Like she just has it. She like some people you just see and they have a level of authenticity and genuineness. They can inject into a performance that you can't teach. And that's it. Like I have no doubt she's been taught how to act at a high level, but she has an extra layer star star quality and an ability to tap into something that's just so real that you just don't see from everyone. She really does. Um, I, I love what she does. I I think she's awesome. I'm excited to see everything that she's got lined up. I'm a forever fan. I've, you know, and I didn't even love matrix revel revel resurrections that much. Um, but I thought she was fantastic in that film and everything that I've seen her in. I feel like she's been so great. So, she has a fan until proven otherwise because I just think she does awesome work and she continued that in this movie despite uh, what I would consider subpar source material to go from. So great job, yes. Jessica Henwick. You are absolutely a rock star. Crush it. 
All right, Kirk. Let's talk about the production. See what the Russo brothers did with this film and what we liked and what we didn't like. Let's start with what we liked, and that is a segment called Showstopper. Kirk? Going with Showstopper, there's a lot to feast your eyes on in this. It's very visually um, aggressive. Uh, It's very... It moves uh, constantly. I would say that its truest form to action and spy flick is... In this shootout scene in the city square, uh, what just after Alfred Woodard is just absolutely annihilated uh, like a boss, <laughs> like blows up her whole apartment with uh, <laughs> with running the gas and lighting her cigarette. She has lung cancer, <laughs> and that's how she dies. And the scene that Ryan Gosling like gets bl- you know blown away from the building, and the police show up, and then. Uh, Chris Evans' uh, team is on them trying to just murder one person. They're just trying to murder Ryan Gosling. He is handcuffed to a stone bench, just a massive stone bench, and he's hiding behind it. And what I love about this is the chaos of it. There are millions of of citizens in this square. There are all of these different police officers trying to secure him. They're like, wait a second. We can't kill this guy. We are the real police. We need to ask him some questions. He needs to be processed. Then, of course, Chris Evans' team is coming in, his Black Ops team, to come and kill him. So, uh, consequently, they're killing all of the real policemen and some citizens along the way. And Ryan Gosling is just sitting on this bench or behind this bench trying to reach for stuff, <laughs> for weapons and killing a guy here killing a guy there and uh, I mean it is so so magical it is such pure classic action Uh, I often say that there should be um, like a scene that gets Oscar nominated like best scene in a movie and honestly I would throw this scene in there because it's so perfect for what it's speaking to in this story in fact that it's it's so self-aware too that at one point Chris Evans shouts because he's up, he's running the uh, the entire operation from a different location, and he says, "How many people does it take to kill one guy?" He's a sitting duck, you know. Like it's so good. I absolutely love that entire scene, and specifically, here's even more uh, diving into it: is that Ryan Gosling finally gets a gun. He has to kill a guy real quick, and you're like, finally, he's gonna blast that handcuff off with one of the bullets. He runs out of bullets and he just, he so perfectly just drops his head immediately in just like, are you kidding me? <laughs> and it was so expertly done. I got to say that's my showstopper, that whole sequence of events. Well, we're in lockstep here, Kirk. For me, it was the Vienna <laughs> shootout. That's what I had in my notes. The Vienna shootout and, and the ensuing tram uh, cut scene where he's riding the tram, tram through the streets of Vienna. Um, and doing various James Bond esque things in the tram on top of the tram, uh, you know, cloak and dagger hiding in the shadows type of thing. He has this great moment, which I thought overall, the reason I like it in this moment sort of highlights that is that it's really creative from an action perspective. And I thought that most of the, um, action set pieces were fun and cool and, and, and decently inventive, like the one in the plane was pretty cool, um, minus the crazy visuals that happened as they were, as he was like choking a guy who was skydiving so he could ride his parachute down. Like that looked a little bad at times. Yeah. Anyway, they had some really inventive action uh, set pieces, and this one, the Vienna set piece, was the best of them all because of all the things that Kirk said with the handcuffing. Yeah, you know, you literally have. Chris Evans character saying, can somebody please shoot the guy who's handcuffed to a bench? Um, which is pretty funny as well as Ryan Gosling being on top of the tram, pointing his pistol down at a guy who's inside the tram. He can't quite see him. Then he realizes that he's going past a building full of windows, looks at the window, aims his gun and shoots the guy dead by using the reflection. Um, as well as some really slick car chase scenes, which I'm a sucker for a car chase. I have to say, Ana de Armas behind the wheel while there are rocket launchers and, and 50 cows and all kinds of crazy things going off. The tram is, has been derailed crashing into a building and she does a fast and the furious J turn to catch Ryan Gosling as he jumps off of it. Just really inventive, really exciting action set pieces. And that's where the, that's where the Russos really flex their muscles. I think the one thing that sticks out to people about some of their bigger films, like, uh, 
Civil War or Civil War and um, Winter Soldier is the practical effects in the in the fighting scenes, and that was definitely on showcase in in the Vienna cutscene. Certainly, there is some CGI there with the tram, but they do a lot of things practically, which just make it look more real, and they do a lot of really slick editing to make it look good. So definitely my showstopper, same as Kirk. It was the highlight of the film um, and, and a scene that I that I will remember and, and will be iconic whenever I think of this movie going forward. All right, Kirk. Iconic. Director's Shoes. What notes do you have for the Russos? My Director's Shoes. There was a viral video, I don't know how many years ago, maybe two, maybe one, who cares? There was a viral video of these kids that were really good at flying drones and the the speed at which they flew these drones in interior buildings was absolutely insane the video in particular they were filming uh, some footage for a bowling alley and they they come in at from the outside the doors are opening somehow magically or or by the employees and they go in and they swoop around the entire bowling alley like six times they go through the arcade and the food court and down the lane and literally through where the pins would fall and through all the machinery all the way down the line and back through from the, from behind the bowling pin set back up the lane and someone's bowling. And it's absolutely incredible. I don't know the names of these guys, but I guarantee you that is who was part of the cinematography crew. Uh, maybe not team a, but probably team B and, there were so many swoops going on in this movie like that that made absolutely no sense to the actual storytelling of this film. Uh, they they It came in, and it was rapid, and it was kind of random. It happened probably like maybe 12 times altogether. Uh, at first, it was only kind of like establishing shots, and you're like, Eh, that's kind of a neat trick. And then, but sometimes they were kind of wobbly, the, the, the camera frames themselves. I'm like, nah, not, not, not too professional there. And then they were incorporated in the fight scenes. And then there, at one point, you know, Ryan Gosling jumps into the water uh, with his, uh, with, you know, Billy Bob Thornton's niece and they're swimming away. And so they're also uh, Chris Evans, you know, his castle uh, portion gets blown up and he's jumping and you see him swoop and, and kind of fly up. And then they disappear like those shots why, they could have been cooler if they were built into the whole body of the storyboard of this film, and really they were just inserted there as kind of a little extra flavor. It was very disjointing whenever those whenever those camera angles and swoops came in. The only part that it worked was the big Vienna shootout and the big tram, uh, you know, running on top of it. That's the only time it works because you had so many different things happening. So I wish that there would have been better ways to incorporate what was going on there. Perhaps they needed to be planned out better because you got like, you know, quarter shots, right? Like, so you started to get like a really cool visual and then it cut away and you had your normal camera angles. So that to me was the biggest disservice of this movie. That's how glaring uh, and and how disruptive it was. Um, I also, from a production standpoint, you had these really cool um, color blasts, right? There was all this smoke and the flares and stuff that, that just like omitted all of this colorful smoke and, and just uh, created this world of, okay, this movie is called the gray man. Look at these cool visuals that are going on. And it happened like definitely the, the near the very beginning. And you know, as he's attacking Sierra four unbeknownst to him at the time, of course, uh, definitely near the end and then uh, not really anywhere else. Um, so I really wish they would have committed to that and had some more, options where you had these explosive colors uh, i don't know how they would have done it but if you are going to introduce it like that then it needs to be consistent and it wasn't consistent and then finally on what a shame you have all these other characters you wrote their characters to their fullest actually every single one of the main characters except for her and i think like that's a big that's a big no-no on my book i'm about to jump on the weirdest soapbox in the history of the world, but seriously, Kirk, the the drone epidemic that's happening right now in cinema, it has to stop. Yeah. It has to. This is getting uh, out of hand. Like, you should have to take a test or a- apply for some sort of license before they start handing out drones to you for your movie because they are doing the most nonsensical drone shots I have ever seen in 2022, if it's any indication of what's to come for drone shots in movies, we are in bad shape because that 
Michael Bay movie Ambulance had some of the most nonsensical drone usage I have ever seen ever just chaotic <laughs> and this movie is not far behind on the drone stuff it sounds stupid but it is like nonsense the one you were talking about where they julia butters and crit and uh, ryan gosling had just jumped in the water and then the drone kind of swoops over the water it looks like a, a cut that they didn't mean to have in the film like yes. it looks it looks like uh, like what are we doing here and there is only literally only one drone shot in the entire film that I was like, okay, that added value. I was like, that was a cool shot, but the rest of them are literally garbage and they make no sense. And they're very distracting. I, I just cannot with the drones. Like it is an epidemic and it needs to stop. We have to get these people under control. Like drones are good and can be used for cool cinematic things. Like what you're talking about with, I've seen that bowling alley video. There are cool things you can do in a movie, but you can't just be like, yeah, we're going to throw in a drone shot. I don't really know what, but let's just kind of drive it around and see what we get. That's what it feels like is happening, and it, yeah. it must stop. It, it really is like the grandparents have found out new technology oh gosh, and they want to try it out. <laughs> and I hate to say that about such great genius minds who have given us the most incredible pieces of cinema uh, in the past, but that specific choice is a very poor choice. That's why it boggles my mind. Like it just doesn't, it doesn't make sense why it's happening. Like, do they think that it looks good? I I just, I can't, I can't make sense of it, but it's seriously, it's, it's, it's out of control. And I know that that's weird, but it it, it is, it's, it's nuts. Okay. For my director's shoes. Actually, you brought up the thing about colors. I actually thought the lighting was really good in this movie. I forgot to mention that in my showstopper. I thought the lighting was, was spectacular, but my, (laughs) I'm all over the place tonight. My director's shoes is there is um, <laughs> this. This is going to sound like a really weird phrase to use for this, but this movie is aesthetically disingenuous. Like it feels like it is the aesthetic that they've chosen to go with. If you can even call it that in this movie in terms of like s- color grading um, costume design things like that is extremely derivative of properties like um, John Wick, for example, some of the more recent Bond stuff, um, things that have a really good sense of color grading and style that are in this same realm. Um, Even like, what was that movie? Gunpowder Milkshake Mm -hmm. and some of the things Mm -hmm. that have come out recently that have like this really cool visual style. It's sort of it's sort of beginning beginning to get a little washed out because everybody's trying to be John Wick. But in this movie especially, it felt really disingenuous and like they were just putting people in weird costumes just to do it. Like none of the costumes that Ryan Gosling wears in this movie, except for maybe the one at the very end, whenever he shows up in like the gray suit with the white t-shirt, make any sense. The, the red suit he wears at the beginning in the party um, with whatever Ana de Armas is wearing, as well as everything Chris Evans wears in this film are just completely insane and make no other sense other than they were just like, we want it to be cool and kind of like modern and colorful and things like, it just felt like it had no place or purpose or, or intentionality behind it and it made the movie feel really ingenuine to me. Um, couple that with the fact that to me, this story is like pretty blah. Like I don't really care too much about Ryan Gosling. Like once they start adding in the stuff about his backstory with his dad and his brother, that's cool, but it comes too late and it's too, it's not built out enough. Um, but I don't care much about like his relationship to Fitzroy, <laughs> which the, who I, I didn't even think that, um, Billy Bob Thornton did a good job in this movie at all. I didn't think that reggae Jean page did good. I thought he was real bad. So, but the, I mentioned earlier, the dialogue is really rough, but I think the story too is just bland. The dialogue certainly could have been better, but the story just really isn't all that compelling. Um, and add that with the, the disingenuousness on the, on the aesthetic. And it just feels like some sort of out of the box sort of jumble. I do think that I'll save the rest for my overall thoughts, but that is ultimately my director's shoes is this just feels like <laughs> here, here was the thought that I had. It feels like um, you had an AI watch every 
uh, action adventure spy thriller that has happened over the last 30 years, including like John Wick, the, the Mission Impossible movies, um, whatever else. I mean, every all any number of things that we have reviewed, even even the bad ones, and it spit out this movie. Like even the title, like The Gray Man, is such a hilariously uh, like ominous yeah it's just like it's just the most hilariously ambiguous spy thriller title ever like it's it's like gemini man or anything else like it just feels oh, so gemini man. it just feels like so spit out of a mad lib um it, it's it's so funny so like you know how when people do like we had an ai watch every single batman movie and this is the script it wrote first of all those are all fake but this movie is like what that like what would happen if you did that all the way down to the Ana de Armas casting the Ryan Gosling casting, cause it's like blade runner. Um, it's, it's funny, but that is the thing that I think of like, this just doesn't feel like anything original. It feels completely derivative in every sense of the word. Well, let's talk about our final thoughts, Cam. Let's do it. You first. I have always loved a good action flick. I have uh, been a fan of Die Hard from the ripe old age of nine. I think my parents lo- allowed me to watch it. Uh, they said, here, son, go enjoy some good American fun. And they sent me into the living room <laughs> with a VHS of John McClane and a bowl of popcorn. I kid you not. I think I did see that at age nine. And I have just had such a love and thrill for action. And on that, this movie does not disappoint And that's where the criticism of film is so tricky because it's so subjective. Can you judge and rate, uh, critique a film by its category that it's specifically falling in, but it also can't just do whatever it wants and get a full 100% because, oh, it's just a chick flick. Oh, it's just an action movie. Oh, it's it's a teeny bopper movie, whatever it might be. You still have to abide by good storytelling rules. And... Uh, I have been uh, one to double check my palate recently with, um, you know, I watched Spiderhead with Miles Teller and Chris Hemsworth. And for some reason, I really enjoyed that movie. (laughs) I don't know why (laughs) I really did. And man, people have just destroyed it. Uh, They've destroyed it, which, you know, that's fine. And I feel like this movie Um, I'm worried about my score because I really did have a fantastic time watching this. I really did uh, get emotional about Julia Butters. Again, um, you know, I love her from Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. So there's that. So while this movie is not the greatest action movie of all time, far from it, uh, it is a very fun movie. It is a very... Uh, enticing movie it does not keep you engaged the whole time i will say uh partly in fact because of those terrible drone shots but it's a good run it's a good effort i would say that if you're running this against netflix's attempt at getting their own uh properties you know pair this up with extraction you know put whatever mcu uh actor that everyone (laughs) loves in it (laughs) and have them get blown up shot at a hundred times and see how they survive if they do it all this kind of runs the gambit of that uh so i would say the gray man gets a solid 7.0 out of 10 kernels from me i can feel i can feel you feeling the pressure of of the outside onlookers kirk on your scores oh, really? but you gotta you gotta live your truth man and i'm glad that you did i'm glad i'm glad that you're sticking to your guns on Spiderhead. I think that's awesome. Um, I think you liked it more than most people, and I think I disliked it more than most people. But, um, you know, I, I, I'm all for it. That's what it's all about. The, the, the subjectiveness of it matters. Like, that's what makes this fun. So we got to have differences. If we and we And a lot of our feelings are similar on things. We always have to call that out because it just kind of ends up happening that way. But I yeah. always wish that we had more differences. Maybe we'll be... Different on this one. What was your score? Seven two, seven zero, seven zero. Oh yeah, we'll have a we'll have a decent difference. So for me, like this movie looks pretty good in turn. Like I said, the lighting's good. I think the action sequences are well edited. I think the CGI is kept to a, a minimum. Outside of that plane scene where, like, when people are flying out of the plane and getting chopped up by the turbines, like that looks a little goofy. Um, 
but overall, like the practical effects are solid. I like the editing. There's some creative stuff that they do with the lighting, the editing. Um, I liked the music, and it, this is this movie's totally watchable. And and for me, like I honestly watched the whole thing without stopping or or wanting to turn it off or needing to take a break. Like I was decently engaged, even though I didn't find the story all that compelling. I felt like the action was enough to really keep me in it the entire way. I feel like where they really dropped the ball on this and where they could have like raised the ceiling for this movie by a ton is the dialogue. Oh my gosh. I felt like the dialogue was, was brutal at times. And I'm like, Russo's you guys know how to write a script. You've been on some great movies with great group dynamics. You have this great cast here. Why is, why are some of these people having to deliver horrible lines with terrible um, timing? And it's just, rough it's like were you guys on a rush timeline or what's going on it just it, it starts to not make sense um so that was really hard and, and and just overall like the source material i don't think is that solid but the action pieces are great and i will always tune in for a good spy action espionage covert ops anything like that's that's my bread and butter i love it um i was surprised how much i was let down by some of these actors um I was surprised at how underutilized some of these actors were. Paging Ana de Armas, like what in the world were they doing there? Um, and overall, I'm just kind of left like meh on this movie. I th- I, it's totally watchable. It's fine. I did I did not hate it, but I have problems with it because I think mostly it, it had a lot of potential and it didn't live up to it. So for me, I had planned to give it a 5.0. <laughs> you know, I'm sitting there watching it going, it's not good. It's not bad. It's right in the middle. It's a vanilla movie with a vanilla story, and it gets a vanilla 5.0 for me. So um, it's it gets better as it goes on. I will say that, Kirk. That was the one thing I noticed. Mm. Like I feel like particularly the characterizations get better. I feel like the beginning third is the roughest third of the movie. Yeah, that opening is pretty fun. Like right when you're in the uh, in the jail cell, that's pretty yeah, compelling. It is. You're like, 2003 you're like yes i know for a fact that ryan gosling looked like that in 2003 that's hilarious yeah (laughs) and billy bob thornton that's a lie because he always had gray hair but whatever i'll (laughs) look past that um but yeah it really it, it starts pretty it starts a little campy which i dug and then it loses its way and then finds its footing for sure i mean i swear to you when they called out billy bob thornton's niece i was like I'm done. Like this right? is terrible. Like you're like, I it's care his less. niece. It's his niece. It's not even. Yeah. Like, and they flash and then, to that like hospital scene. And you're like, Oh my gosh, <laughs> this, no way, no way. But then they, they got me. They're like, okay, that was, you know, his brother and sister, yeah. you know, brother and wife died, whatever. And so there's the only family like, okay, I'm, I'm in. And then the, the, the flashback solidified it. I was like, solid, good move. Good move. Yeah, and I have to say, man, this is really bad first impression for me with Reggae Jean Page. I thought, yeah. that, I thought he was overacting. I thought the I thought the dialogue was bad, but I thought he was way overacting. I thought instincts were all off on all of his scenes, and like I haven't watched Bridgerton or anything, but I was like, this is the guy that's the big up and coming star. Like, yikes! I I just did not think this was a good role uh, or performance from him, and. There are some others as well. I thought Billy Bob Thornton was awful. I thought, yeah. I, thought um, I thought Julia Butters was good. I thought Ryan Gosling got better as it went on. He's always really good, so his floor is pretty high. Um, but yeah, there were some stinkers. It was it's a it's weird. But there's that moment where Chris Hemsworth kicks Billy Bob Thornton in the face and breaks his nose like like immediately. Yeah, and Billy Bob Thornton is just like, <laughs> dude. <laughs> I could not with him in this movie. I could not. It's like, come on. I, that had to hurt. Yeah. Uh, the the torture scene too. I was like, this is, I don't know what he's thinking, but this is not it. This is not it. Um, yeah. All right. That's our review of the gray man. Kirk gives it a 7.0. I give it a 5.0. We're sticking to nice round clean numbers. We must be feeling a need for control and tidiness in our lives. That's me that's right. interpreting that. But Go check it out if you haven't already. Hopefully you heeded my warning on Tuesday's episode or Monday night stream when I said, go watch The Gray Man. We're going to be reviewing it um, and did so so that you were able to listen to this. But our next film review should be Nope. It should be. We wanted to review it this last weekend. 
Crazy busy schedules got in the way, but Kirk and I are absolutely chomping at the bit to see it. I am trying to avoid the spoilers. I'm almost certain there's a big twist in this movie because it's Jordan Peele, so I'm like, I'm dodging them, Kirk. I'm really trying to stay off the social because I'm I'm very excited for it, but we'll have to check it out and review it. In the meantime... I'm I'm really scared. You're scared of it? Yeah. You know, I didn't even watch Us because I was horrified of... Just the posters, honestly. And <laughs> us is scary. Uh, us is scary. Um, but it's not like the most scary thing ever. Okay. All I right. feel like it's well, to- I feel like it's tolerable. And I feel like this won't be the, the scariest thing ever. I'm gonna go watch us tonight. Oh gosh. And if you get a knock on your door <laughs> in the middle of the night, <laughs> oh, it's no. because I need to I need to sleep next to someone yeah, strong like sleep you. on the floor <laughs> next to my bed like my kid does whenever he has a bad dream. Yeah, right. I didn't sign up for that, Kirk. Now I'm <laughs> now I'm second guessing it, but uh, we'll have to go see the new Jordan Peele and see how we do. Um, thank you guys so much for listening to this episode. Really appreciate your support as always, and I especially appreciate the support of our executive producer Ryan Spriggs, as well as the band Rhetoric, who created our original music. Find them anywhere you stream your music, and we will see you guys next week. Talk to you then.